All right, my friends, it is that time of year. The weather sucks, it's dark outside, it's cold, there's nothing really to do. So you watch movies. Yeah, we watch a lot of movies this time of year. And so I thought today, well, how do I explain this? This kind of started as like a little nostalgia trip for me. And I was like, oh, do you remember these movies, Abby? Oh, these are such like guilty pleasures. And then like, but then they weren't guilty pleasures, but they're actually not bad. Anyways, I thought it would be kind of fun to go through five of my personal opinion of the most underrated historical costuming films. And there's kind of like the subplot of them being like early 2000s nostalgia, if that makes sense. So, you know, for all of us feeling that like, high school nostalgia. Here, here we go. So with that, we are not talking about Pride and Prejudice. We are not talking about Downton Abbey's. We are not talking about Little Women's. We are talking about movies that often get overlooked in the discussion of historical costuming and films. Um, I hope you guys are ready for this little adventure. We're going on an adventure, Charlie. Arthur and his knight. Number one, the inspiration for this video. <laughs> is 2004's King Arthur. <laughs> oh. Hey. This movie was just like a gift. It is just a thirst trap gift that frankly does not get enough credit. So a few weeks ago, the Welsh Viking, Jimmy, did a video called, When Did King Arthur Exist? <laughs> when King Arthur is from is something of a matter of debate. He talks about it from perspective of movies that have come out about King Arthur versus like what historical information we have to actually have about King Arthur. My conclusion while watching this video is that the 2004 King Arthur starring Clive Owen, Johan Griffith, Kira Knightley, Hugh Dancy, Mads Mikkelsen, Joel Edgerton, Ray Winestone, Stellan Skarsgård, and other dreamboats is that it's actually also one of the more historically accurate representations of King Arthur in media. And I was like, oh, so not only are you telling me, Jimmy, that this movie, which has been a guilty pleasure ever since I was a teenager <laughs> and definitely had a massive influence on why I really wanted to go to grad school in the UK because I was on a hunt. I have like soupy hair in my eye now, hold on. That King Arthur is like 2004 with Clive Owen is like the more historically accurate one. So I can lust after like all of the... <clears throat> so, so here you have it folks. Not only is it a guilty pleasure, not only is it Kira Knightley circa Love Actually and Pirates of the Caribbean, not only does it have like thirst trap actor after thirst trap actor, not only do we have the Hannibal stands like free Hannibal, we have early Mads Mikkelsen with face tattoos. <laughs> it's so good. It's actually not that historically inaccurate. So there you go. Guilty pleasure. Have fun watching that. Let me know what you think. If you've never seen it before, you're welcome. Miss Pettigrew is my new social secretary. After the lingerie, shall we go shopping? So number two on this list is 2008's Miss Pettigrew Lives for a Day. And it takes place in London in 1939, like right at the start of World War II. It is the most beautiful vintage movie. Like, ugh, it's so good. <gasps> Oh, he's a much bigger boy than I had expected. Oh, you know it. <laughs> like it takes place over the course of a day and it's just this wild romp through like society London. We have comedy, we have music. We have love stories, we have drama, we have a little bit of suspense, but the costuming in this movie is incredible. Like we are talking peak like 1939, beautiful suits, beautiful evening gowns. We have a whole gamut of social classes being dressed. We, I mean like that blue suit that Amy Adams wears, oh my God, like it is just with her hair. Oh, it's perfection. And like, honestly, like lingerie plays a whole thing in this movie. And like the lingerie that we see in this movie is just perfection. And I don't understand why we don't wear top pants anymore. What do you think? Do I get the part? Hmm? Oh, yes. <laughs> Like, frankly, I think we should be wearing tap pants. I think, why haven't they come back? Like, Silk Charmeuse tap pants. Like, I'm starting an official petition to all the underwear companies out there. Bring back Silk Charmeuse tap pants. Please and thank you. Sign the petition somewhere. I don't know. 
please. Another maid to do the washing, ladies. That's if you can afford one after you've paid through the nose for one of these fruit fruit. And I honestly don't know why we don't talk about this movie more. And it was probably honestly one of the movies that really inspired me aesthetically. It gave me that moment of, I would like to see more of this in clothing. The movie's stunning. So if you have not seen Miss Pettigrew List for the day, highly, highly recommend that one too. Let's go, Lizzie. Sock him in the jaw. What? what? And after you finish watching Miss Pettigrew List for the day, I highly recommend that you check out the sponsor of this week's video, Acorn TV's Miss Fisher's Murder Mystery, which takes place in the 1920s in Australia, and it is also close to me perfection. So if you are not familiar with the sponsor of this week's video, Acorn TV, they are the largest commercial-free British streaming service available, and just for $5.99 a month, you can have access to thousands of hours of commercial-free streaming of movies, documentaries, period dramas, murder mysteries, just what have you, with new releases coming out every week. And after you finish watching Miss Fisher and you're looking for another cozy mystery series to snuggle up to, I can recommend to you Manhunt, which is an Acorn TV original series that stars Martin Clunas as DCI's Colin Sutton, sol solving all sorts of very intense mysteries. And you can stream Acorn TV on all of your favorite streaming devices via their app, via Apple TV, Google Chromecast, on your browser, wherever you like to stream, you can stream Acorn TV. And with Acorn TV, there's always something new to discover. You can try Acorn TV free for 30 days by going to acorn.tv and using my promo code Abby Cox. That promo code is in all lowercase letters and all together is one word. Case matters, okay guys? Just matters. And with that, thank you Acorn TV for sponsoring this week's video. And now to number three. So like, I don't know how y'all feel about like Jane Austen movies because we get a lot of Jane Austen movies, right? And so like, that is just like how we interact with like Regency era fashions, I feel like. Like we don't ever really get Regency era stories outside of Jane Austen, which is, it's like, it's fine. I love Jane, don't get me wrong. But Bright Star from 2009 is just, Oh my God, I rewatched it last night because I was like, oh, if I'm gonna film this video, like I need to kind of like re-familiarize myself with, with Bright Star because like it hasn't really been available for a while and it just got released onto Netflix and I forgot how visually stunning this movie was. This is the first outfit she wears, this. I don't feel like I need to say more than that. Like, just look at this, it's perfection. But it takes place between the years 1818 and 1821. It's, it's a story of Fanny Braun and John Keats and their like romantic relationship. And what we know about Fanny Braun is that she was very into fashion. My stitching has more merit and admirers than your two scribblings put together. And I can make money from it. I don't think she was like apprenticed or trained. She might have been, I've read conflicting information about that. So she might have been trained in like a milliner, but in the story, at least it's, it's indicated that she is not a woman who works, that she's not of that social class. I think she just really likes to sew, but like they make all these beautiful sewing references and fashion references in the movie. The textures in this movie and the colors in this movie are just so good. Like the cinema, oh, this movie is just, delicious when it comes to especially like late Regency costume. Like it's done so, so well. It's so beautiful. It is just oh, so good. And let me tell you, Abby Cornish, who plays Fanny Braun, like she did a fantastic job in this movie. I think her performance was severely underrated because that like second to last scene, oh my God, like that is just, whew. So, so good. So if you are like into like Jane Austen movies, but you're kind of like, I don't really want to watch Jane Austen, 10 out of 10 recommend Bright Star. Like that is just great Regency costuming. It's fantastic. Oh, the bonnets and the hats in this movie. Oh, it's so good. And like the millinery, everyone's wearing caps and, just the layers, the textures. It's so good guys. It's just so good. It's Deal all that. And like, I'm really into like jumper dresses for like the Regency era. Like I think jumper dresses are like really cool. And I love how movies are just like, yeah, we're gonna just like rock some jumper dresses like all the time. And she's got these like big soft sleeves. If I was to have like a Regency aesthetic, it's definitely a Fanny Braun in Bright Star. Like that is my Regency aesthetic. Like that's what I like. It just looks so good. And like she has her pelisses and her ready coats and her spencers. 
And then I don't know, here's like this little thing that I noticed when I was rewatching it, is that there's this like little scene between her and John Keats where he like asks her about his coat. And he's like, well, what do you think I should wear? And it's like this linen, it's too big for him. And it has like, it's, you know, it, but it's blue. She's like, you should have a blue velvet coat. And then like later on, once their romance is in full swing, but it's health is deteriorating, spoiler alert, she starts wearing a blue double-breasted oh i can't i think it's a i think it's a red and goat i don't think it's a spencer but it's the same color blue or very similar to what he wears but then there's velvet on it oh my gosh that is amazing detail because it's like she's starting to dress the way that like he dresses she's mirroring him in this sort of way but she's used velvet like she said he should wear he never does actually wear a velvet coat you know it's just that nice touch because it's like the same color blues and just oh, the use of color in this film is just so good it's perfection. So you don't see a lot of just like plain white Regency. And when you do see white Regency, it's mixed with color like they would have. And it's just, oh, this movie's so good. I love the colors and the textures. The fabrics that they used for this movie are just amazing. John Keats, his waistcoat, the back of it is a black beetled linen. When I saw that, I was like, did you really get, be you actually got beetled linen from the back of this waistcoat. Like I just, I cannot. Like I just can't, it's just, so good. And then the plaid for Mr. Brown, who's a jackass. He's, he sucks. He's the worst. Like, he is the worst. What an asshole. Anyways, Bright Star. If you haven't seen it, go and watch it. And be prepared to, like, sob like a baby. But it's so worth it. Be careful. They can smell fear. This is history of art. Number four on this list is a movie that is, it gets talked about a lot, especially within like dark academia inspirational posts and, and content. But I wanna talk about it just from like the aesthetics and like the costuming of it, is Mona Lisa's Smile. This came out in 2003. It's an incredible cast. It takes place in 1953 at Wellesley, the all girls school. And it's about this art history professor. We got gender issues, we got- There you are ladies. The perfect likeness of a Wellesley graduate. We got romance, we get oh, coming of age. It's just so, so good. And it has one of like the best monologues like out there. Like the scene, oh, the lecture scene. Contemporary art. No, that's just an advertisement. Quiet. Today you just listen. What's really great about this, we have good vintage 1950s costuming, but we also have it like from spanning of social class. We have a spectrum of why we're wearing these clothes from like more formal housewifey dinner party, workwear, collegiate wear. So it's just visually, it's stunning. The hair is great and we have different ages. It's just a really good movie to watch. You know, frankly, I think the 2000s were kind of almost a golden era for like really good historical costuming films. The costuming might not be like super historically accurate, but like when you think about it, they're really good i mean like i'm not even talking about these two but we also still have Marie antoinette which came out in 2006 and the duchess which came out i think in 2008 or like 2007 two of the best historical costuming films of all time don't even get started with me on Marie antoinette like that's a whole different video it's one of the best movies out there the end in a discussion okay moving on when we got there all we found was sand and blood you get your bags Final celebration of underrated historical costuming films based purely off of their historical nests and not for general popularity, but I'm, I'm coming out and I'm, I'm gonna throw this one in here. It's technically not in the aughts, it's, it's from 99, but that's kind of like one of the same. The Mummy. Ooh, that like dinged at the same time, wow. I know, I know. You're like, Abby, that's not an underrated movie. That is like one of the best movies of all time. I know, I'm, I, I'm not disagreeing that point. It's a very popular movie too. We have bumper stickers about it. We have t-shirts about it. We are currently going through a Brendan Fraser renaissance, which is well-deserved. He is, he's Brendan Fraser. He's perfection. But I want, <laughs> I want to take a moment to point out that the costuming actually in the mummy, not, I'm not talking about the Egyptian stuff. Like Rachel Maxey did a video with that with the vintage Egyptologist. Like you can go watch that to learn about how actually relatively accurate the Egyptian stuff is. Evie's outfits are amazing. The costuming and makeup and hair for Evie for like 1923 is just so good. That opening library scene. Volume two and volume three. Her outfit is just 
so perfect. The very early 20s, very end of the 19 teens. Her hairstyle with how it's curled, it's that got that history mullet thing going on. Her eyebrows, which I know people are like, I'm so glad her eyebrows improved in the second movie. <laughs> no, they were technically worse. Her eyebrows were actually historical perfection in the first movie, which I just really appreciate looking back. The skirt gives me a little bit more like 1930s vibes than it does like 1920s or like late teens vibes, but that's like a really nitpicky thing. And it's not like entirely true. The vibes that it gives me is just a little bit more 30s than like early 20s and like 19 teens. But like her shoes are perfect. The visual culture of that movie is actually really pretty good. Let's not just watch it because that movie is perfection in every other way, shape, and form, but we can also enjoy it for the historical costume and aspect of it because it's actually really damn good. It's a win-win situation if you think about it. <laughs> So with that, I do wish you all a very cozy season coming up. I hope that you've added some of these movies to your list. I recommend all of them for a variety of reasons. As you can tell, some of them are just pure thirst traps, but that's okay. I don't care. It's something for everybody, right? Right. If you all enjoy hanging out with me, don't forget to subscribe. I post on Sundays. And with that, my friends, I hope that you all have a lovely rest of your week, and I will see you all back here later with another video. Bye! This was like the Jon Snow's before like Jon oh Snow's were a thing. But like, this is Jon Snow aesthetic, okay? It's a yum yum world, it's not the one where all the world of